Thank you to Your Excellency, Mr. Torre, and Ms. Badi for that enlightening session. Let us now take a step away to gain a different perspective. In fact, let us take a giant leap and move into space to explore how space technology and data can help us gain a better understanding of environmental, economic, and societal impacts here on Earth. I'm going to turn things over now to Hadley Gamble from CNBC, who will moderate this panel. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week's conversation about the backbone of digitization. We're talking about the next generation of space technologies. I'm your host, Hadley Gamble, CNBC's anchor and senior international correspondent right here in the region. And I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our guest, Fahad al -Mahari. He's the acting executive director of the space sector for the UAE Space Agency. Welcome, Fahad. Camille Fournier as well joining us. She's an aspiring ESA astronaut and Mars walker as well. And Johan Dietrich Werner, he's the Director General of the European Space Energy Agency. Excuse me. Thank you so much, panelists, for joining us. We really appreciate it. I want to kick off by asking uh, Faha to take the first question, which is, of course, one about not just the security of space. We talk so much about data and what that is going to look like in the coming years in terms of who owns that data, whether it be private corporations or nations. But in terms of what happens next with regard to COVID-19, so much of this data and so much of this intelligence has happened over the last several months. What does this do in terms of informing how government should be responding to COVID-19? Well, uh, I mean, I tend, when, you, when you go back into the COVID-19 aspect, you know, so much has happened uh, throughout the year. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of businesses have been hurt. A lot of businesses has been hit. Um, you know, the economy overall uh, has been, you know, has suffered due to the situation. but. Uh, you know, going back to the UAE and uh, what we have managed to achieve during this time has been quite interesting. Uh, you know, we've had uh, the launch of the Emirates Mars mission, which, uh, you know, has been a great success during the pandemic. Uh, it was a huge concern for us in terms of uh, getting the logistics right. Uh, we had to rush aspects uh, in terms of uh, getting the uh, probe over to Japan uh, before lockdowns and closures. And, uh, you know, it's been a big success uh, on that front. Now, uh, when, you, when you look into the aspect of uh, the data and the relevancy now in terms of everything that's coming through, uh, it's, it's always going to be uh, something interesting when you come into the remote sensing and the space and satellite data that's coming through today. Uh, and I think more and more people realize it's uh, something that we need to use uh, more of. Uh, it's something where you have an eye out there in space that can take a look down at what's happening here on Earth, um, where we were in a time where you couldn't have people running around to measure and monitor certain aspects and take a look at what was happening on the ground uh, due to the concerns of the pandemic. And I think more and more this is uh, something that people saw was very feasible. Uh, and very attainable. It was very effective. The data, you know, was coming through uh, in, you know, matter of almost real time and people and governments could take decisions uh, and informed um, and take informed decisions during that time. So, you know, with that and the uh, spurring on of big data, uh, as you mentioned, right, this is all now about utilizing machine learning capabilities and the AI capabilities and that really spurs on opportunities um, for not just the government, but also commercial entities to look at the new space opportunities and using that data, taking a look at how to use it and uh, providing that as a service, not only to governments, but uh, the commercial realm. Jan, when you think about this with regards to um, the future of tackling this pandemic, obviously it's not something that's going to go away in the short term. What have we learned at least so far? So, I mean, if you want to go in, into the uh, into the COVID aspect, and I think it's really about understanding the spread, understanding uh, certain situations. Um, but, um, you know, for, for us as the UAE Space Agency, it's, uh, it's, it's not something uh, that we are focused on specifically today, where we are really looking at the space aspects of technologies that we have and how we can 
uh, drive those capabilities uh, into the universities, into technology growth, uh, academia, and really advanced development uh, and uh, technologies, really. Um, when we talk about this with regards to the European Space Agency, Jan, I want to bring you in on this because obviously the, the data that's been collected, no doubt, over the last uh, 10 months um, certainly could, I assume, inform governments as to how they should be thinking ahead with regards to tackling COVID-19. What have you learned so far in your view? Yeah, what is very important for me that we have a, a little bit, how should I say, a, a, a view from a distance because we have to learn something by that. And I make a, a parallel to the climate change. Climate change and COVID is more or less the same process. Very strange, huh? But what is very important at the beginning, and this is the most difficult part, is to discover the effect, to discover what is happening. So we saw some people in Wuhan being ill, and we had to discover it is a virus. We see, we see on the planet Venus that uh, it's very hot, and we had to discover it's climate change. The second step is to monitor it. So to get data, as you're saying, to get data about the spreading of the virus, to get data about the, the, the dimension of climate change. The third thing is to raise awareness. Using the data, you can raise awareness to the people by doing out of the data information. This is a process. The same with climate change and with COVID. And the last step is the mitigation part. So you, you should do something against it. Now in COVID, we hope, we all hope that the vaccination will solve that issue. We hope, we don't know. And the, the case for climate change, what to do there. There's also a solution by using the data, using Earth observation, navigation, telecommunication. We can, for instance, give airplanes a better route with less contrails. We know that contrails are very efficient for climate change. So therefore, by reducing contrails, we can also fight climate change. So what I want to say is the data should be available. And there's always the question, is the data owned by the company? Is the data owned by whom? And I always say very simple, data is owned by the one who is paying for it. If a company has its own money and, uh, and getting data, they own it, they can sell it. If a public entity like European Space Agency is owning the data by, uh, by uh, paying for it, then who is the owner? It's not the European Space Agency. It's the member states. It's the taxpayer. And that means the data should be free and open accessible. That's interesting, isn't it? Because it does raise questions about security. Um, when you think about this with regards to what we've seen in terms of the conversations about vaccinations and, you know, should this be country specific and you know who should be vaccinated, when they should be vaccinated. Uh, does it concern you at all um, as we move further down the pike? Um, Jan, about the security of that data, who's going to own it and whether this could end up being a real fight? I'm a naive, optimistic person, and uh, I don't trust any security question by that. I believe we have to understand, for instance, some people are saying, ah, we have to save the planet. Bullshit. The planet will survive the humans. We have to save humanity and we have to save biology. And we can do this only by working together globally. The pandemic shows us that a single solution here or there is nothing, is nothing, not at all. So what we have to learn and have really to do together, working together, exchanging data, what is if we give the data from our measurement of uh, CO2, if we give it to China or to Russia or to the United States of America or UAE, is will they use it for bad reasons? Not at all. It is good. So let's exchange data as transparent and as open as possible. That's the possibility of uh, getting this uh, future without any fences and walls. I mean, we I'm a German. Huh? We got rid of our wall and I would don't want to build new ones uh, in, in our brains. We're talking about regulation. We're talking about the potential um, for long term um, societal and, and potentially security impact here. Camille, when you think about this with regards to what it is that you're aspiring to do, what's your greatest concern? Um, that the fruits of your labor essentially will be used to an adverse purpose, or frankly, um, that, that people just won't be able to understand the best use of the data that you're going to be collecting? Well, I think that actually the pandemic is uh, spending a lot of money and a lot of time to everyone. And there is some uh, things that we have to do 
but the pandemic just uh, stopped us to make it. But it's important to to do these things because we actually need to uh, do something like uh, you you speak about data. I'm completely agree with uh, Mr. Warner. We talk about the fact that the Earth will survive because actually uh, we live in the world that uh, we're completely in advance and uh, we uh, trying to make um, um, how can I say that? Uh, we're trying to make um, for stopping the virus. Uh, but um, in fact, this is taking too much time and efforts. And in my opinion, the pandemic will be. And uh, I hope at the end of uh, 2021, because uh, uh, with personal my role of students, uh, it's really difficult and uh, there's a lot of friends of me and a lot of people in the same uh, situation as me. Uh, that pandemic is just uh, stopping us to living our best moment in the university and in our studies and it's uh, stop us to yes, yeah, so, to dream. So it's important to to be focused on. Yeah, to see beyond this and uh, to to see in the future what we can do and uh, what we can do. Uh, uh, what we can do to create a better world and um, without this pandemic that actually take uh, all of it, our time. To not be limited. Fahad, when you think about this with regards to what we've seen over the last few years, obviously Donald Trump was a major uh, voice for rebuilding NASA and looking uh, forward to creating a space force. Obviously a new administration is coming in, one which is much more focused potentially on, on green energy and what that will look like over the next four to eight potentially years um, coming from the US. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to put the same amount of money behind NASA. Does that make your job more difficult in the sense that you're looking for secure partners, right? Whether it be in the private sector or in the public sector to really work with in terms of finding those data driven solutions. Would it be easier if you had a long term partner in, in terms of the US? Does that you know change the way you're thinking in terms of who you work with going down the pike? No, I think, uh, you know, the UAE and the US have always had amazing relationships. Um, I mean, it's, uh, you know, from from back when the UAE was only five years old, we had astronauts from the Apollo 17 mission come and visit our late forefather, His Highness Sheikh Zayed bin Nahyan, and they brought him a gift of a moon rock, you know, that is you know, it shows you even when the UAE was only five years old, was the UAE already thinking about space and thinking, you know, how we can move forward. And, uh, you know, the US has always been a huge supporter and still is today. Uh, so we have plenty of projects that, uh, you know, we are working on together and moving forward with. But we uh, are also not only reliant um, on the US. Uh, so we do a lot of work together with a lot of the other countries. We've had projects that we've been running together with JAXA. Uh, of course, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening today. And, and for us, we are still so new uh, relative to all the other, uh, you know, the giants in the space industry. So we have a lot to learn and we can learn from, uh, you know, a lot of different partners. I mean, we have cooperation with over 35 different uh, space agencies today. Uh, from uh, around the world and you know we're looking at utilizing uh, all of them uh, as much as we can today in a situation where uh, it's all about cooperation and I think for us in the UAE today it's the public private partnership uh, which we're really focusing on now and is something we want to help grow. Um, the UAE again is very young uh, in the field, we have been encouraging entrepreneurs to have startups and doing things. We've been working with, uh, you know, entities who have come out from Europe and brought in entities or companies who are in their Series A round with capabilities that can help and support. Um, you know, we've held competitions. Uh, we have the Arab Space Cooperation Group that has been established, and it's all really about the sustainability aspect of. Uh, the space sector, ensuring we have continuity. Uh, you know, we are not only learning from others, but we are today as well in a position where we're able to help others learn uh, from our lessons and everything that we have done. 
Um, you know, going back, let's say, to, uh, you know, we learned a lot from NASA, of course, in the space laws that were out that, uh, you know, the uh, European Space Agency developed, and we now have our own space policy and space law and regulations put in place and are also our own national space strategy. Uh, it's funny how things have now come full circle and you have countries, I mean, even the US have come back to us now saying, hey, we want to update certain policies and regulations. Uh, you guys have been the latest to do things in that field. Can you help us? Uh, and, you know, the Artemis Accords that were recently signed was something huge as well, where uh, we as the UAE, such a small country, were part of the eight uh, initial countries to help draft the Artemis Accords. Um, so that shows how you know, it, it goes around full circle and we all in the space sector are, need to help each other. We all need to cooperate, similar to what Mr. Verna was saying, where, uh, you know, this is space. We look at it from a bigger picture and we need to think at the humankind level, not, you know, my country and my capabilities and what I do, but really what we can do for humankind. May yeah, I say you think May yes, I please. Do you know the song of uh, Simon and Kathonka? Bridge over troubled water. This, <laughs> this is really can be that space. bridge. Space is a bridge over troubled water. So during my term as uh, being in space, I had three governments in the US and we always had good relations. I counted recently, I worked for 10 ministers in Germany and we have 22 member states in ESA. That means uh, if you say a term of a minister is four years, that have, means we have five new ministers per year. And it's possible. Space is above all of these earthly problems. And let's let's keep it there and not militarize the space because then we will be there and we'll fight over there. So that's not good. When you think about this though, Jan, with regards to the private sector, who are the best partners in your view when it comes to data collection, when it comes to space? I mean, who are the best partners to work with? Is this something that's about money or is this something about regulation? How do you see this playing out? Because the there are so many private partners who want to get involved. The best partner is in private as in public uh, domain who has the same sense of understanding. It, it can be a private company, it can be a public organization. So I would not say just public, just private or this private company. We have uh, in ESA, we have a long tradition of doing public-private partnership. We started in telecommunication. Today we have public-private partnership as well in uh, Earth observation, in navigation, in launchers. And this is a good model to make uh, to make industry ready for the global market. That's the purpose. Huh? Uh, and commercialization, we will see that space will be more and more commercialized. In 50 years, maybe we don't need any longer any space agency, or maybe for exploration and science and security, but not for the general things. So therefore, it's good to have partners in the private and in the public sector. And I'm so happy to have always uh, the, the partners worldwide to work together in space. I'm so happy about that. But Camille, weigh in on this one because there's a lot of excitement surrounding the fact that uh, the private sector is so much more heavily involved in space than they have been in the past. Where do you see the opportunities? Well, actually, uh, the some private agency are in the way to develop the tourism uh, in space. And it's uh, really interesting uh, for my part and for uh, every part of uh, the tumors that is actually around the world because um, uh, if we are not selected by the agencies to go to space, we have this opportunity to maybe just buy all places. Uh, if we have, uh, if we are in good health or uh, if we have everything uh, good for it. But actually, um, I think that there is a multitude of uh, possibilities in uh, into it because um, because yeah, uh, actually we live in a world there that is just grow the the space interest is just growing more and more and with uh, artemis missions and with mars missions this is going to be uh, more interesting i think and uh yeah i keep waiting to to see everything uh, uh just be aware and uh, see the first uh, human on mars is going to be really uh, incredible i think Falhad, when you think about what the goals are going forward. I mean, when you think about the next like five to 10 year horizons, what is in your view, 
the sort of shared goal here, do you think, across space agencies and the private sector? What should it be? Should it be getting to the moon again? Should it be getting to Mars? I mean, what should be the thing um, that, you know, as the overarching goal? Um, data collection, security of space, I and mean, what is it that we should be looking towards as a benchmark? I think, uh, you know, one of the main things, uh, you know, looking at it in, in the sense of sustainability, right, uh, in terms of looking at the, the overall aspects of things, we had a very interesting um, uh, event uh, with uh, UNUSA uh, just early uh, December 2020, uh, where we were really looking at the aspect of sustainability. Now, when you look at sustainability, um, a lot of people, especially when you look at the UN aspect, it's all about the SDGs, right? And this is definitely one of the main things that you are looking at. And I think this is familiar to everybody across the world in, in school and in, in governments. You know, this is something uh, built into our national agenda here in the UAE today and something that, uh, you know, our leadership have really taken uh, at heart and really put into everything that we do here in the UAE. Um, and I think, uh, so the space sustainability, I look at it in three different angles that we need to take a look at. One is the SDGs, right? So sustainability of using um, a space uh, to ensure sustainability on Earth. Secondly, is to identify how we can ensure that space remains something sustainable and, uh, you know, something that is available to not only us, but our future generations as well. And thirdly, uh, looking at the aspects of how we can ensure that uh, space as a sector, as a, an economic aspect is something sustainable. So when you look at the SDGs, I think that, you know, a lot has been done already in that point. And it's been amazing how today, I think the, um, it's uh, the space for SDGs now has been put together, right? And it's all about identifying how space can now help monitor and look at it, look at aspects of SDGs in a much more feasible way. And I think this is where a lot of change is coming in uh, to help that. Secondly, in terms of the sustainability for the space environment itself, you know, the UN has been looking at the long term sustain uh, sustainability of the outer space activities. You know, we have a lot of debris out there, a lot more satellites. You know, over the first 50 years, you went from a handful to a couple of thousand. And now in the last 10 years, you're going from a couple of thousand to tens of thousands. And, you know, you could look at it with all this doom and gloom of, oh, you know, if, if we keep going the way we are. But at the same time, like Verna said, um, you know, things will continue. The commercial entities will find a way and they will find a business opportunity there. We're going to have garbage collectors out in space tomorrow and, and that's what's going to happen, right? It's not it's not going to stop. We can't always think that the technology isn't going to be there and that drives us today in thinking what technologies do we need to have garbage trucks out there orbiting Earth and collecting the debris, collecting that so that we can continue advancing technology, continue launching the latest satellites, continue getting the best data that we can. And, and then really for me, it's the space sector sustainability where it's not as, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Verna said, maybe there will be no space agencies in the future. Why does he say that? Because today it's really the governments that have had to really put in the money, right? It's, it is, this is a long-term investment. Nobody could enter this domain before, but it was something that really inspired people. It brought hope and inspiration and drove technology, drove STEM education, drove for a lot of things. And now with this new space, the new commercial aspect of it, uh, you know, we've all seen what's happening with SpaceX and, you know, the, the outcomes there. And it's that data that is now available that never used to be available. Now a lot of people can take a look at this data apply machine learning to it, apply, uh, you know, uh, AI to it. And if you have old data, now once you get new data, you can very easily replicate a lot of the, the responses and things there. So it really will continue and will drive forward. And I think that for me is, is something we really want to look forward to and, uh, and I'm really inspired to, to see happen. Uh, we're going to have more entrepreneurs coming in. We're going to have more uh, growth in that sector, and it's it's something that I'm excited about for the years to come ahead here in the UAE. Jan, what's the challenge there? Is it the politics? Is it the security? Is it the fact that everybody's going to want to make a buck? What is it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love so, that. One word answer. All so, of the above. Then. Come back to the to the thing of the space debris. We, uh, I asked the member states of ESA to pay for uh, space debris removal. And it was very difficult to convince them because they said, ah, that's debris, that's a waste. Why should we do that? It's not our waste. Uh, but I finally convinced them. And so we asked a small entrepreneur to build a, a system and to uh, bring down an ESA-owned asset in Spain, a space. And I think there's very a lot of crap up there yes, floating around. And to bring it down. So, and there is, uh, as, uh, as uh, Fahad was saying, we have uh, 5,000 satellites right now and we will have ten thousands of satellites it's very important in the future we should also have a common understanding i don't say law because i'm not a person looking always for laws i would not kill a person just because uh, there is uh, no law a uh, law for it i would not do it huh? i never without a law uh, or with a law but we need a common understanding that in future each and every launch of a satellite has either to prove that there is a deorbiting system on board an independent or they have a contract with the company saying we will bring it down when it's not working or to give a deposit to us to the agencies and we will take care of that so one of the three solutions that should be the future with or without law how likely do you think that that's going to be something we see in the near term 100 percent because it's necessary before we let you guys go i just wanted to ask camille to weigh in in terms of what your aspirations are uh, for the future, because there's so much excitement surrounding this field, um, and frankly, not just from the private sector, all the investors who want to make a quick buck off of this, but also from governments, and Fahad was mentioning this with regards to the aspirations of countries. What is the excitement there in your view? Well, uh, my generation, we, we like to call ourselves the Mars generation, because we know that the person who is going to put the first steps on Mars is actually alive and he is going to prepare his himself to to or go she, and she or she yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> well actually my dream is to become the first french astronaut to set foot on mars and i walk uh, every day to uh, achieve my goal by doing some trainings and uh, doing uh, some uh, research by my own uh, i do some uh, certification and spit and um, some trainings like uh, scuba diving trainings, like caving trainings. I do some uh, trainings in Belgium at the European Space Center, uh, where I can try some different simulators uh, of uh, astronauts uh, in the uh, 50s. And uh, it's really interesting because I learned a lot of things around this uh, circle and uh, I try to share everything with uh, people around the world because I think that uh, if uh, this can just uh, motivate someone uh, who loves that field and uh, just he can say that, yeah, I wanted to do that too, uh, this could be just awesome because we just create some uh, little bit community around it and uh, it's important right now to see uh, all of this uh, excitement around it and I think that the future will be incredible. No doubt about a collaboration and community. Guys, I'm just going to leave it there. We have about a minute left to go. But I wanted to thank you all so much for joining us. This has been an interesting chat and an interesting way to look at things um, beyond walls, beyond borders. And frankly, um, just to, to note that the challenges are really about, in many ways, trash collection. The future of space, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank always you. look forward. Always look forward. You have no eyes on your back. That's true. Thank you guys so much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Goodbye.